I'm Malcolm Roseman in Atlanta, Georgia on September 25th, 2003. I have the honor of speaking with Val Archer, also from Atlanta. Val, let's begin by just telling me where you were born and when and a little bit about your early years. Okay, uh, I'm Val Archer. Uh, I was born in Chicago, Illinois uh, on my grandmother's birthday in 1929, uh, April 13th. Uh, I attended uh, elementary school uh, at Betsy Ross, uh, and I recently heard in the news uh, is still, a, still around and having probably more difficulties today than they were having then. Um, I eventually, uh, as my family moved from one, from one neighborhood to another, um, I transferred to different schools. I eventually uh, graduated uh, uh, from summer school at a school called Charles Kosminski, which was over on the, the far east side of Chicago, I believe, um, from the uh, eighth grade. Um, I didn't go to high school, uh, sort of dropped out then. Uh, my mother passed when I was 12, and I guess um, I didn't have the type of supervision that was necessary to compete with my peers at that time, my environment. Um, uh, I joined the service in uh, 1945. Uh, because I was out of school, I associated with uh, some fellows who were uh, a few years older than I. And uh, I sort of followed them when they went into the service, and it was my plan to follow them, and so on. You were quite young when you went in. Uh, yes, I was. Um, but um, I was sort of caught up, as I think uh, many people were, with the, uh, what we, we know as propaganda now, uh, the way the, um, the war was described uh, through the mass media, and uh, throughout the community and every kind of institution. Uh, we were sort of bombarded with uh, uh, information about the enemy and the Axis and, um, and so on, and, and the uh, Uncle Sam needs you, and the USO, and uh, uh, the newsreels, and so on. And in my young mind, I was caught up very much in that. And I figured that, uh, I, I think I estimated that uh, since I wasn't very productive at that time, uh, in any case, uh, uh, being in the military service would probably not be a bad thing for me. So I tended to follow in the footsteps of some of the older guys, and I tried to enlist, I think, uh, first in the Marine Corps, and then the Navy, and then the, uh, the Maritime Service. and. Uh, uh, that went on, in, in fact, for a couple of years, and uh, uh, one day uh, another a friend of mine and I were um, uh, passing uh, a recruiting station and decided we'll just go in and heckle these guys because they're, they're not going to take us anyway. As it turned out, I think on that particular day, uh, I've since deducted that probably that recruiting sergeant didn't have his quota at that time because uh, Freddie West and I both wound up uh, uh, being processed uh, straight through <laughs> and, and finally loaded on to the back of a 6x6 uh, a six six and, and shipped out to Fort Sheridan, Illinois, uh, where we were uh, inducted and sworn in and so on into the service. Uh, from there, it was a short trip, uh, a short time. Uh, before moving on into basic training in, uh, in Wichita Falls, Texas, and so on. Um, my early, early years uh, in Chicago, um, I think, uh, as I look back, everything seems to be sort of normal in, in my, own, my own terms. Uh, perhaps it would not be normal uh, for uh, someone else who was observing that, as I observe young people today, uh, some of their uh, experiences are extraordinary, and I think uh, probably some of mine were as well. Um, I had um, uh, two brothers and, and one sister. Um, uh, one of my brothers recently passed uh, a couple of years ago. Um, they, my, both my brothers sort of followed me into the, into the service. Of course, they went to high school and, and graduated. Were you uh, the oldest? I was the oldest, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, 
Let's see. Well, let's go back to um, your back to your military. Uh, you're now at in in Texas in okay. Basin. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, as I recall, that was uh, that was quite an experience, and and as I look back at it, some of it, uh, I find some humor in it. Uh, Growing up in Chicago as I did, and uh, I had I did my time with gangs and and so on, and uh, as I came into the service, uh, I sort of brought my uh, myself uh, into that into that uh, picture, and uh, uh, obviously came into conflict with people from other other backgrounds. Uh, <laughs> I recall. Uh, uh, an incident uh, with a, uh, a wrestler uh, from Oklahoma who was, uh, I think, uh, I guess he was probably about 200 pounds and I think I was probably about 130 pounds. And one day uh, he had decided that uh, since uh, our, our um, uh, organization at that time uh, was very close to his home, uh, from, from uh, Texas to Oklahoma was just a short trip for him. Uh, he had figured out that, that uh, if he managed to get our training set back, then he would have an additional amount of time uh, uh, near home and so on. But I thought that was kind of silly and kind of selfish on his part. And, and so did a, another kid from, from Detroit who was all probably about my size, uh, who uh, said something to this guy and he got smacked. And uh, I thought, well, if he can get away with that, smack this, this kid and get us to go back and do that, you know, then I'd have to try my luck with him. So uh, we were on the second floor of, uh, of this barracks. And so uh, almost immediately we were tumbling down the, tumbling down the stairs. <laughs> uh, and that, that, that lasted for, I think, a good, a good 20 minutes or so, maybe longer than that. Um, but uh, I, 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 I rather enjoyed it, uh, and, and looking back at it, it, it to be uh, um, bloody or, or uh, have that kind of physical engagement uh, was not unusual uh, for me. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, I think probably fortunately for me it was, because it was not for, for the wrestler. <laughs> so we both wound up going to the, to the hospital. And, and I just always have some find some humor in that, in recalling that uh, that experience. But I have um, to I have to stop you and ask you a, a question because um, I think it's Tremaine. Um, you you went into a segregated army. Yes. Um, and my knowledge of the segregated army at the time was most of the offices, maybe all the offices that were around, mm -hmm. tended to be white. white. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you feel about all that? Uh, I, I guess uh, I had some feelings about it, but uh, as I was incorporating all of this new experience, uh, uh, I didn't know anything about uh, uh, anything about the military, about um, the officer corps, the enlisted corps, or, or any of that. That was something that I had to learn. But I very quickly learned that uh, that some of our white officers were quite racist in their outlook and their expectations. And uh, with my attitude, as I was describing with the altercation with this wrestler, uh, I would have had the same, uh, the same propensity to, uh, to deal with them in the same way. Um, I guess I was fortunate in a way uh, that I, I received a, a few reprimands in that and had a lot of extra duty, but uh, I never punched one of them. So uh, I therefore managed to stay out of uh, serious serious problems with it. But uh, I, I fairly quickly became aware of the, became aware of the fact. And it was not, it was a kind of a group learning experience. It wasn't just that I was learning this myself, but I was learning it from the other guys who were in the organization and their attitudes, some of which, uh, which I adopted, some of which I rejected, uh, and so on. But um, I managed to keep a perspective over uh, my feelings um, of uh, individuals that I was uh, I was involved with, and uh, uh, I, I met some some pretty rotten uh, white officers, 
and uh, I met some very good uh, good officers that I uh, later learned uh, what a good what a good officer uh, was and how he performed and uh, I, I quickly learned the difference I think so you did what the six weeks of basic uh, yeah it seems it seemed to have been longer than that but it may, may have been six okay. weeks mm -hmm. okay then what well from that uh, I went to uh, I went to an aviation um, an aviation squadron. Uh, that's what they were called at that time. Because when I when I enlisted, uh, um, I had an opportunity to indicate which organization I wanted to, to belong to, and I, I checked the uh, the Air Corps, uh, not knowing much about it, but other other than uh, what some people had told me, and. Uh, I didn't have any expectations one way or other at that time. Uh, it didn't matter which branch you were in, you were still a soldier. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, all of the, uh, um, for all appearances and uh, uh, for the uniform and, and the attitudes and the values and so on were still that of a soldier, So which, which was Army. Um, I, I later on learned that being a part of this aviation outfit though, uh, uh, I didn't know at the time that there was uh, an effort to uh, to develop this all-black uh, outfit, which was still going on uh, since 19, 1941 and 1942. Before you go further, you put down to join an air group, okay? Mm -hmm. right. Was there something that triggered that thought in your mind? I mean, I, I recognize that they were all part of the Army and they were all soldiers, but, mm -hmm. but still, I mean, going up and in, in a plane, you know, that whole thought uh, mm -hmm. for somebody who grew up in a Chicago yeah. neighborhood, that's, mm -hmm. that's pretty extreme. I mean, did, what, what, well, uh, were you a risk taker? Were oh, you big time. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would, uh, I would take any risk at that time. Okay. Uh, although I did not perceive that, uh, that as a risk. What I knew about, uh, about uh, airplanes at that time was uh, now that I know they were uh, DC-3s mm -hmm. uh, that used to fly very low uh, over, over Chicago and uh, you, know, you would hear them coming for, for days and, uh, uh, and, and they, of course they were, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, they were slow you know, mm -hmm. because you could, you, you could see them uh, if you were not um, in an area where the buildings were very tall, you could see, actually see this DC-3 just flying over. And, uh, on its way, and I thought, boy, that would be great uh, to do that. Uh, my uh, my exposure to anything to do with aviation uh, was uh, was kind of fantasy stuff that I read in, in comic books, and and uh, I think there was a radio serial at that time. I think it was uh, Buck Rogers in the twenty mm -hmm. fifth uh, century or something to that effect, uh, and that was sort of. Um, I read a lot, and uh, that was one of the things that I knew just a little bit about. So when I, I had a choice of uh, of being in the army, I thought, okay, marching, carrying a, uh, a weapon on my shoulder, uh, or uh, flying in, a, in an airplane, whatever they did in the airplanes. I didn't know anything about, uh, mm -hmm. you know, fighters and bombers and, and stuff like that at that time. But I thought it was a it was a pretty good choice, and, and I and I really didn't expect to get it. I just thought, okay, I'm going through this stuff, and uh, I was uh, uh, psychologically geared to uh, to a kind of a racist uh, culture uh, that I could not articulate at that time. Uh, but my expectations were uh, that uh, you're going to get the short end of the stick anyway, so uh, just. Uh, put down whatever you think you can get away with and then and go for it. All right, so you moved into this to where at this point? Uh, my first stop uh, after uh, basic training at Wichita Falls, Texas, was a place called Geiger Field up in uh, it's Spokane, Washington. And I went there. That was a that was a fairly pleasant experience, you know, being out of the city uh, and out of the uh, out of Texas, uh, which is another world by itself. Uh, to go up into the mountains, and it was cold and pristine, and uh, a new experience. And and uh, I was excited about it. 
and uh, I, I went to a, a, I think it was a, a demolition, a demolition school. I uh, went to learn how to blow up stuff, <laughs> which was uh, uh, not inconsistent with my character uh, at the time. But uh, when I uh, uh, completed the training, I was very quickly put on a train and uh, with orders going to uh, to join this 332nd um, fighter group. Uh, in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, that's where I went to spend uh, the next uh, little more than three years until the integration occurred. Okay, so you were in Columbus, Ohio for three years at that point? That was my, my base. Your base. Of course, I left there for you know for training uh, at different places in mm -hmm. Chinook and uh, um, Chinook and Scott and uh, Keesler, Mississippi. And, so, short train. At, at least for the to the World War II piece, you were always mm -hmm. in the state. You were state star. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. What What were you trained for uh, in Columbus? Uh, well, when I got to uh, to Columbus, one of the first first uh, assignments that I had was uh, as a, to work on a, a P forty sevens as assistant mm -hmm. assistant crew chief. And uh, initially, that was a gopher, but uh, that was called on the job training or OJT. Uh, which I, I uh, became in, involved in. First in uh, aircraft and engine uh, mechanics, mm -hmm. and then I sort of gravitated to uh, uh, to uh, uh, instrument specialists, where I worked with the uh, uh, instruments uh, and uh, and related component mm -hmm. parts, um, like the, um, the instrument doesn't operate just by itself; it operates on some principle that's related to something else, like a airspeed indicator, for example. Uh, in those days, we had what was known as a, a pedostatic tube, uh, where that would register the, uh, the pressure, you know, the, the forward motion or something, and that would be registered into this, uh, this uh, airspeed indicator uh, that would do that. And then there were uh, engine instruments, uh, manifold pressure gauges, and uh, tachometers, indicators and so on. I mean at this point you you were 17, 18, 19 years 16. old, even younger, 16, uh, when you first went in. Um, you never went to high school, here you are getting a whole education. How did you feel about all that? Uh, I, I thought it was a real challenge and, and uh, uh, it was a hoop. I, I enjoyed every minute of it, and, including all the other uh, altercations that I got involved with. The thing I, I did not enjoy is uh, uh, I did an awful lot of uh, KP, uh, washing pots and pans, and uh, uh, be reporting to that at like 3 o'clock in the morning and, and working on that for until 7, 8 o'clock at night before, uh, you know, getting off. They taught you discipline. Yeah. Yeah, I, had, I can tell you some stories about, about <laughs> I, I had some pretty creative uh, you know, first sergeants, <laughs> uh, yeah. But I uh, I managed to to, uh, to not spend a lot of time in the guardhouse. Uh, I did get to know most of the guys over there on a first name basis. But, okay, uh, I'm not sure we need to go into all the details on no. that. Uh -huh. Tell me, um, so so you were in Columbus, in that for the, for the most part till about 1948. 48, 49. 49. Now, yeah. I believe Truman integrated the services 48. in 48. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did that affect you? What, what, what well, direct? That, that uh, in, in terms of, uh, uh, of segregation, uh, that really brought, brought that home uh, to me. I, I, you know, from my, my growing up part in, in the civilian community was in Chicago. And it was not like growing up in, in, uh, in Georgia or Mississippi or, or, or someplace like that. Uh, so I had a whole different kind of learning uh, thing to get a grip on. Um, uh, it, it, uh, it occurred to me when I left this all-black outfit, that was the only kind of uh, military experience that I, that I was aware of. In fact, uh, one distinction we, we briefly mentioned earlier about the uh, White Officer Corps. Uh, when I finished my, my training, 
uh, and went to, uh, to Lockburn. Uh, that was the end of my white officer experience. Uh, our officers were all black. And, uh, and uh, in my estimation, far more professional and qualified in, in every way than those uh, white officers that I had met uh, prior to that time. Um, and they were good mentors. Uh, some of those guys I met back in those days uh, who uh, decided that they would take an interest and teach me some lessons, which they did, a lot of them. Uh, I still know those guys, so was, uh, we're still surviving. <laughs> and we can recall some, uh, some interesting experiences from those days. Uh, but as far as the integration uh, was concerned, that was my first experience with, uh, with segregation uh, and from a different sense because I was moving from an all-black uh, community uh, that had its own social and political and other kinds of dimensions into an all-white uh, installation where uh, um, there may have been 2,000 uh, white troops there and, and, uh, and three black troops. Uh, the, the black uh, troops who were uh, already um, serving on those installations uh, were uh, in the, uh, the food service uh, jobs and uh, uh, motor pool and uh, uh, what were considered unskilled, unskilled uh, jobs at the time. Uh, when I hit, uh, my first assignment was at Bowling Field Headquarters, uh, uh, USAF. And when I reported in there, although uh, I'm sure that it was well publicized that you know, you're going to get some black troops uh, coming in here, uh, and probably that they, uh, they are skilled and qualified uh, people. Uh, when I went to first report it to the flight line, I was told, well, uh, I, I was a sergeant at that time, and I was told that, uh, well, you can't, uh, you can't supervise uh, anybody here. We can't have you supervising any white, white troops, so uh, we'll have to find something else for you to do. Uh, uh, until we get uh, a white person who will come in and be over this, uh, this, this shop or this, this position. So I wound up uh, being sent off to uh, uh, tech schools. Um, uh, I spent uh, more time in tech schools and, and then I decided I would uh, try and play football there. You know, I didn't weigh very much, but I, I was fast and I, I liked the game. So I did that for, uh, for a season. In fact, I did that until uh, the, Korean, uh, the Korean War. Uh, my ex first experience initial with that was um, I, I had orders uh, to go to a uh, Korean assignment. And I was shipped out to uh, a base um, port of uh, debarkation, I think it was called, in. Uh, in the San Francisco area, it was an army base, and uh, when, I, when I got there, uh, I stayed around with uh, a bunch of other guys who had come in from different places, and uh, we were going to be on this joint assignment, I guess, going, leaving together anyway. The war in Korea had already begun? Oh, yeah. Okay. And so, uh, um, while I was there, um, Waiting, wait, waiting with, for my uh, direct orders and that, you know, I just had orders saying, okay, you report to this, this space, I can't think of the name of it now. Uh, and then with further uh, travel to, uh, to uh, K-6 or K-6 or K-9 or something like that. In, in any case, um, uh, when we finally, finally uh, got uh, our orders to move out on the, on and board the ship. I remember that the name of that ship was the uh, the General Altman, which was a troop uh, troop carrier. Um, uh, I wound up on this this thing for uh, I think for about about 30 days. We were on that boat, um, just weaving in and out of the Pacific, uh, sick as a dog. But. Uh, uh, we were told that uh, you know that that was necessary, and the reason that you're going on this route is because of submarines and you know the whole uh, kind of scary stuff. 
Uh, in fact, what happened was uh, I, I wound up being dropped off uh, on, on an island after we left Wake Island. Um, and we went to Kwajalein, uh, and then from Kwaj, about another few days after that, uh, wound up at, at uh, Eniwetok, which is another mm -hmm. another island in the Marshall uh, Atoll. And this is the first time you've ever left the country at that uh, point? Yeah, yeah, as a matter of fact it was. And uh, I was glad not to have to go in that mode of transportation again. That, that troop ship, I think we were stacked up about 13 high in this place, and you know, it's always a guy on top mm -hmm. who gets sick first. And then uh, <laughs> trying to find a place that we can breathe, you know, to get up on deck was, uh, you know, that was a whole routine, you know, getting permission and so on. Were you part of a unit at that point, or you were unassigned? I was, uh, I was assigned to a unit and didn't know it. I, I was assigned to uh, a special task force, and I remember that, it was called uh, task Force by number 3.4.1 was our designation. And I think there were, um, there were, um, how many of us who got off with that? I think there were seven of us who got off and were dropped off uh, on, on this island mm -hmm. at, that, uh, at that time when the ship moved on and went to its uh, next destination, which may or may not have been Korea. But uh, anyway, I wound up there, and this, this project turned out to be uh, a nuclear project to test an atomic device there, and, uh, uh, which was a, a whole other kind of experience. And uh, some of the training that I received there was, was interesting as well. That, that whole experience was, uh, was interesting. Well, when you say training, what were you trained for? Well, uh, we were, our mission was to, uh, to fly these uh, drones through uh, uh, an atomic cloud after the, uh, the weapon was detonated. And then uh, the drones would come back and, uh, and um, be, be examined or, or um, all the checking that was mm -hmm. done by, I think, you know, Atomic Energy Commission guys were there. Uh, we had, uh, uh, Navy and, and Air Force uh, were there in this uh, joint uh, joint operation. Um, and your role in all this? My role, I was assigned there uh, as a, an instrument uh, instrument specialist. Uh, there were two of us uh, uh, assigned to that uh, that mission. I'll never forget this guy, a guy named Dolan, <laughs> um, a white guy uh, who was a, a kind of a senior senior instrument guy. He had been, I think Dolan had uh, had his 20 years in at that time. And uh, he taught me a lot. Uh, uh, the two of us, we, you know, when you're on an island that size and uh, uh, practically nothing to do except work and read and, and so on, which we, we all did a lot of, I think. The other thing was to, to booze and fight. Uh, I did a little bit of that. Uh, but, uh, um, Dolan, Dolan uh, uh, taught me a lot about, about instruments, instrumentation, and so on. And we had, uh, through our briefings, uh, we had a pretty good idea about uh, um, um, testing uh, devices, which were going on at that time, mostly out in the, uh, we heard about what was happening in New Mexico uh, mm -hmm. and uh, other places in, in the States at the time. So when one of these devices uh, were tested, were you able to at least see the... Yeah, well you could uh, understand that the, uh, um, the, the the device was detonated I think either on or near an island called uh, I think it was Njibi, it was, I think it was 35 miles from where we were on mm -hmm. Inuita. That was uh, what the report was, but yeah, we experienced the whole thing. The, the uh, 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 the detonation uh, from that distance, uh, as I recall, uh, our, our instructions were to uh, lay on the ground and we had uh, some special eye protection and other stuff and we laid on the ground and covered our 
face in the opposite, facing the opposite direction of the blast. I'm not sure that that made a lot of difference because when, when it went off, it was the most brilliant light. Um, and it was almost like you could see it going through your body and through the ground and, and everything else. And I'm, I'm trying to recall which was, um, um, if, if we uh, felt that the island was sort of moving back, uh, back and forth like that. At least that was the sensation. You, f you felt the, the pressure the, the, from the, the blast itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and of course this, the sound was, uh, I think the sound, the sound may have been first, yeah, I'm sure, no, I don't know whether the sound was first or the flash was mm -hmm. first um, from that distance, but uh, they were separated by a, a distinct period of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it lasted for uh, quite a while. It, the detonation was uh, early in the morning, uh, maybe two or three o'clock in the morning, and so on. And uh, and we were still sort of experiencing that uh, way after uh, uh, after dawn, the next the next day. Uh, and then, of course, we we were busy again uh, with our our separate uh, operations. Mm -hmm. How long were you on the island doing this? I think for, uh, it was less than a year, mm -hmm. uh, maybe, maybe maybe 11 months or so. Mm -hmm. I recall that it was less than a year. Um, yeah, um, maybe 11 months or so. Mm -hmm. What was next? Next, uh, uh, I came back uh, intact with that, with that organization. Uh, for the most part, and I was assigned to uh, Eglin Field uh, to a proof test wing. And uh, when when I got back there, I sort of picked up right where I left off uh, with um, the base in Washington. Was uh, with that um, uh, we don't have a we don't have a spot for you on the flight line. Um, and I, I'm sure I was offered. Uh, Would you like to work somewhere else? Would you like another? another job somewhere. And I, I recall uh, um, going off to some more some more tech schools uh, at that time. And uh, So you're getting a heck of an education mm -hmm. at this point. Well, I, I, I got some technical training, but uh, it was not really not really an education. I knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. That was, you know, it was pretty pretty obvious. No one uh, tried to conceal um, the purpose or the reason for any of this at mm -hmm. that time. Um, what I had, I had been to uh, Eglin Field before because uh, while stationed at Lockbourne, uh, we had our gunnery, uh, gunnery uh, training there at one of their auxiliary fields uh, where we went every year. We went to, uh, I think there were several auxiliary fields there and uh, different years we went to different ones and to do, uh, uh, to do training uh, uh, you know, for the pilots to go out and get their uh, their gunnery stuff in, mm -hmm. uh, and of course we had to support that uh, those operations. So I was sort of familiar with that. Um, what really went on uh, at that time was some more. Uh, that was my my first sort of exposure uh, to the South, and and uh, and what what all that meant in terms of being a black soldier. Um, the, uh, the the segregation, the kind of places that we were allowed to go, when we were permitted to go. I remember uh, going to a movie once in, in Pensacola and being told that uh, that blacks had to go, I think, into the into the balcony, but you had to go up uh, uh, the back stairs like a fire escape. Uh, that was the entrance to go up, and there was little. Um, a uh, little place, you know, like, I don't know, a section of seats that we were allowed to sit in. Uh, I, I think that was the only time I ever went to, went to a movie uh, off base. Uh, there were... Um, now, what, you're, you're mid, uh, about 52, 53? No, this is back in the 40s. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when I came, when I came to Eglin, uh, after, after the, um, the uh, nuclear mm -hmm. assignment. 
I, I was somewhat familiar with that installation, so I sort of knew what to expect there. Uh, I, I did have friends, uh, young friends who were who were married uh, that I knew, um, uh, and in Washington, uh, who were assigned there, and uh, uh, they were living in, in a, uh, an area called Skunk Hollow, which was at the bottom end of the, the swamp swampy end of the base. Uh, they uh, had segregated housing uh, on base. Uh, so let me, let me make sure I understand this. Mm -hmm. The army was integrated, but the housing was not? Well, um, yeah, that's true. It hadn't caught up, the integration. Uh, well, the integration was going on. Uh, what was happening? We had, we had uh, um, black troops on on the same base as white troops. Mm -hmm. That was the first step of the integration. Okay. Uh, how it unfolded from there uh, was pretty slow. And in fact, uh, uh, that's where the real abuse came uh, in 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 such subtle and unsubtle ways, uh, like the kind of housing again, that, that my friends lived in, mm -hmm. uh, just be, because they were married and they were uh, allowed to be, uh, uh, have their families accompany them. Uh, they lived in this area called Skunk Hollow. Uh, and there were, uh, um, I'm not sure what, uh, what kind of housing that was exactly. It was like, like shacks. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it was like a community of, of shacks on this installation. And uh, I remember uh, one family in particular had a, uh, uh, an infant, uh, infant child. Uh, and they would, um, uh, the, the deer would, would walk up and, you know, they were very um, uh, sort of domesticated almost. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the baby was uh, crawling around on the on, on the ground among the, uh, these farms that were that were out there. Um, but it was you know so so basic and so crude. Uh, there was no I, I, I don't recall what it was like there in, in the winter. If, I, don't, I don't recall visiting them uh, during the winter months, which could be quite uh, yeah. cold and damp. What, yeah. what what were you doing at this point? What was your role? Uh, at that point, I was most of my time was um, um, waiting for waiting for a, a school assignments. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had I had some some time on my hands. Uh, now, I, I have to ask this question because mm -hmm. you, you're now it looks like you're making it a career. I mean the. At some point in your head, well, did, you know, did, did you ask that question of yourself? Do I want to make the army a career? No, not, I don't. I don't think that was ever uh, a really. Uh, that came later, okay. uh, much later. Uh, I had, uh, you know, we we, we got uh, 1950. Uh, unless you were um, uh, at the point of of completing your tour. Uh, at some point, you got an additional year hung on. It was mm -hmm. called a Truman year, mm -hmm. uh, and that was, I think, because of the uh, Korean War. The Korean War. Right. And so, uh, at, at, actually, by by that time, I think uh, in 1953, I think it was 1953, uh, 1954, when um, I had an opportunity to uh, to get out, uh, I took it. Uh, I separated. That was my uh, 1954. Yeah, I think okay. it was 19, 19, okay. 1954. Okay. Um, and I think it was after uh, after I, I'd gone. I went to um, yeah, I went to uh, McDill in Tampa, uh, Florida, uh, to B47 school. Uh, after I had just I had prior to that I'd gone to a uh, an engine analyzer course uh, that was. Crazy stuff mm -hmm. uh, back in uh, at uh, at Chinute. and then I went to another course at Scottfield. I don't know what that was about. I don't remember that. But I came back and 
I was kind of excited about this uh, uh, B-47, which was a, new, a whole new system, and uh, uh, jet, uh, jet bombers, and uh, really it was a neat, neat system at that time. And, uh, but I knew after I finished that, uh, it was going to be uh, some other, some other thing. So I just decided, okay, I'll take my marbles and, uh, and go home. Uh, and that's how I got involved, I think, uh, with the reserves unknowingly. Uh, I was carried on the rolls for the reserves, um, although I, I was given an honorable discharge. And uh, it was, uh, I, I, I think, uh, I think I had been out for six or eight months or so, and I got this letter saying that, uh, report to, <laughs> um, re report to some, some base, uh, something, I, I don't recall the details of it, uh, but you've been recalled uh, to, uh, to active duty. And I thought, well, I, you know, I have a discharge. I, you no, know, this and, and the Korean War is over at this point. Well, uh, yeah. 54, it, 54 it, yeah, it was over. Because Eisenhower became president That's in, right. in 52. Yeah, so, uh, so I said, well, you know, it's got to be some mistake. You got the wrong, maybe somebody else uh, with the same screwed up name or something. And uh, I, I, I think I, I contacted uh, whoever the authorities were at that time and they said, no, uh, um, no, you've been, you've been recalled and they didn't explain very much as, you know, uh, oftentimes uh, bureaucrats don't do. Uh, and, and they didn't feel any uh, com compunction about, uh, in other words, uh, you know, you're AWOL if, you don't, if you're not here. So, uh, you don't deserve an explanation or something. So uh, my attitude was, you know, come get me. <laughs> so I moved, uh, uh, from then I moved to, uh, to New York, uh, to Brooklyn, and worked on the docks for, uh, I think, I don't know, a matter of months before. I don't know how they tracked me, but uh, I got a letter again saying report to some place. And I left again, and uh, I went to Chicago. And uh, I think I was there for six months or so, and I got another one of those, and so I left and went to. Now, I, I don't think I wasn't wasn't really running from them, but in, in one sense, uh, I didn't feel that I owed them any explanation the same way they didn't feel they owed me one. So we were having a little standoff there. Uh, anyway, uh, finally the. Some really official guys who came, I think, in black suits and stuff, and they said, "You're, uh, uh, we're escorting you to uh, uh, to your new assignment," and uh, they gave me a, a two hours or something like that. And then uh, one of them stayed, and the others left, and then they came back, and so went out to uh, uh, to Mitchell Field in, in Milwaukee. Where you go? What year? What? And this was. I think this was in 55. Okay. Yeah. So you've been out for a little over a year. Oh, yeah. Well, it's more than that. Uh, so it must have been, it must have been, must have been 53. That you went out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because uh, it was over, it was, no, it was more than a year. Okay. Because I was bouncing from. So and now you're in Mitchell. As a matter of fact, uh, Eisenhower, Eisenhower was president, I think, then. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, I, I remember how interesting it was that, uh, that uh, every time you turn on the news or something, all you would get is how popular uh, this guy is. And, and uh, uh, at the same time, you couldn't buy a job. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there were people in soup lines, you know, and I thought, uh, what the hell's going on with, with this, you know, you know, people starving and we're talking about how, how popular and what a good job the, uh, that I didn't, uh, I was non-political at all mm -hmm. at that time, didn't, didn't have any interest, uh, no knowledge of it and so on. But I did think that was, that was pretty strange stuff. Okay, so now you're in Mitchell Field in Milwaukee. Yeah, and uh, I, I think I was there for, uh, for a few hours and I met this colonel who also uh, had an attitude at that time. I don't know if somebody had done something to him. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in any case, he, he had this attitude like, we don't owe you any explanation. Uh, 
you, you hear, hear your orders or, or you go next door and get your orders or something. And I wound up uh, uh, at, uh, at Geneva, New York, I forget the name, mm -hmm. of, the, name of the base here, in the dead of winter. <laughs> and uh, I, I stayed there for, uh, I was there for I think a couple of months and there was some question about whether or not uh, they were going to give me a grade adjustment or if I was going to have to be a private, you know, which uh, ultimately was the case. Uh, they never gave me a grade adjustment. Because you left as a sergeant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you're coming back as a private. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was told that, uh, that the authority for, for that whole operation was something called the Universal Military Training Act. And uh, the, the fact that, uh, uh, that I was not old enough to be out of that, uh, that category. Now this is what I was told and mm -hmm. I never, never got a straight answer uh, about it after. And so it really, it really didn't matter all that much. Uh, you know, I, I, I could, there was no way I could get out of it without going to jail. And uh, they made that clear. So, uh, so I sort of started off all over again. Uh, I didn't have to go through uh, basic training or any of that, but I uh, did get, um, uh, I was, I think I was offered a, uh, uh, a chance to go, excuse me, uh, to be a flight engineer, um, but without the pay. That would be a private. Uh, on that, and so I thought, well, that's not, you know, we can do better than that. So I said, you know, give me a, send me somewhere else. And so they sent me to a different, uh, different school again. So I, I spent a lot of time <laughs> in school, in, in uh, tech school, uh, tech schools, yeah. Uh, eventually, well, let's see. Uh, I was assigned after that. I was assigned uh, overseas again. I, I did a tour on Guam. And from Guam, I uh, did a consecutive tour uh, in Japan and uh, had some, some assignments in Korea, brief uh, TDY uh, periods. And then, and then back to Japan. And uh, I, got, I got married in Japan at that time. Uh, that was a... Uh, uh, that was a, a whole other story. It would take two hours to, to ex describe that to you. But you met your wife in Japan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I was I was assigned from 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 Japan to um, um, the missile squadron uh, ICBMs. I went to the three three ninety fifth missile squadron at um, Vandenberg Air Base mm -hmm. in California. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was another interesting place where there were no, uh, there was no housing at, the, at that time. I think that was a new base, a new facility, a new program, and so on. I was assigned to the Titan. Uh, also on that base, we had uh, uh, Atlas. And uh, now, when you say you're assigned, what was your job with respect to that? Uh, at uh, by by this time, uh, I was in training. Uh, my job was uh, I was an instructor. And I did, uh, I did uh, mostly management training, and then some some uh, technical stuff uh, from time to time. But mostly, uh, I had an opportunity to work for some of the uh, the um, uh, the contractors, mm -hmm. like uh, Aerojet General and General Dynamics, and so on. Uh, at night, uh, learning to write uh, to write uh, technical uh, technical data, and. Uh, so that, that was a good experience. I, I had an opportunity to do that for a couple of years. Um, now what years are we? Now we're in 19, 1958 to 1960, uh, almost 1961, November 1960, okay. when I got another uh, overseas assignment. Uh, but at this point, you're in the Army. I mean, you're... Oh, yeah. You've kind of made your decision to stay? Yeah. Well. Uh, by this time, uh, uh, it was dawning on, dawning on me that I, I was past the, the halfway mark for, uh, for some retirement and I was still 
thinking that at some point, oh, I think I uh, had given up on the the uh, grade adjustment mm -hmm. thing. And, uh, but, and you're still very young. I mean, you're 30, 31 years old in 1961. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I think I felt pretty old <laughs> <laughs> uh, at that time. But uh, anyway, I had to, uh, uh, I had some some good experiences, mm -hmm. uh, some good training, uh, military training. Uh, I think I was probably one of the most trained uh, uh, people in the military, and I had uh, opportunity to, to move into different career areas. And uh, and uh, uh, I, at some point, I got wise up enough uh, to go to night school, and and I continued those. Uh, attending night school uh, throughout uh, the, the period when I was in, uh, in California and then overseas and I, I got my undergraduate de uh, degree, my um, education with the University of Maryland. So you overseas. finished, you finished high, you got your high school diploma, yeah. and then you went on to college and got your undergraduate degree. Uh, well, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, I didn't do it in that order and, uh, that I normally didn't do mm -hmm. things in a proper sequence. Uh, I, I was on the, I think I was on the dean's list um, for two years, and, and someone uh, decided that okay, you have before you go into the next category, whatever that is, uh, you have to have uh, proof of your high school stuff. So. Uh, uh, I, I faked it. No one had ever challenged me on that before, and I said, "Well, I went to the school that my brother went to uh, in Chicago, and uh, uh, it took them about another semester or two to catch up with that." And they said, "Well, they don't have any record of your <laughs> of your attending uh, attending there." So then I was given the option of, of taking the, the uh, GED, which I did, and. Uh, so you've been on the dean's list in college, and now you're taking a GED the, in high school just yeah. to get through, get the piece yeah. of paper that says you did it. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then, uh, anyway, after I left there, uh, that was a that was a long story too. But, but before my, you go on, what was your degree in at, uh, at uh, Maryland? In Maryland, uh, economics and psychology. Okay. Uh, and and that was primarily because uh, uh, at the at my last. Uh, last year and a half there, um, because of other people rotating out um, and my having uh, the most time remaining there, uh, I became the education officer. And uh, so I hired the, the faculty to teach the, uh, the off-duty uh, courses for University of Maryland. And uh, the two best instructors that I had uh, was a, a young guy, Dr. Lou Everstein, uh, who was at Oxford, uh, I think he was doing, he was reading philosophy there, and an economics uh, professor from London School of Economics. And uh, these are two best guys that I had. And then, and then I got another uh, economics professor uh, who had been uh, at West Point, uh, and he was back at Oxford getting his master's. And, 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 uh, so I had these guys consistently over, and but you're still, but you're still not an officer. Oh no! Doing all yeah. this, and you're not an officer. No. Uh, well, uh, I, uh, it, that that didn't bother me as much as just not having enough, not having enough money <laughs> to support my mm -hmm. my family. But then there were uh, uh, there were there were occasions when I had an opportunity to work a part time job in the officers' club or. The, NCO club or something like that. But with that. all of this knowledge and background, and there was no way of you going into an office no. candidate situation? No, no way. Mm -hmm. Was that in part because of the racial issues of the time? or? Yeah, I think so, because... Uh, even uh, even in the 60s? Oh, yeah, uh, because I had, uh, I did apply for uh, a program known as Bootstrap mm -hmm. um, to go away to get your final uh, semester. Uh, uh, to get your degree, and uh, uh, that was put off. In fact, when I when I got my undergraduate degree, I had uh, I had um, I was already taking graduate courses, and uh, uh, because I uh, I had more than enough 
enough to graduate, except that, uh, you know, you had to do uh, one year, um, your final year had to be at mm -hmm. the institution that you got your degree from. So after that, where, where did you go next? Well, I came back, uh, back to the States and I uh, went to, uh, I was assigned to the Syracuse, New York, um, where, I, again, I was the education officer. Uh, I, I didn't have the, the grade, but uh, I was the only person that they had uh, to do that. And uh, um, I did, uh, part of my graduate stuff I did uh, at, um, at night, again, at uh, Syracuse. And then I got a fellowship uh, to finish up uh, my uh, master's and uh, another one to uh, begin my PhD studies in. And I was moving in, I changed my, my field uh, from education uh, to political science and public administration. And uh, I wound up uh, with my doctoral studies in uh, interdisciplinary social social sciences. Uh, uh, shortly after, uh, and I, I, I retired there, I planned for retirement. In 1968. 1968, yeah. And uh, at that time I was offered an opportunity. Uh, the way it was put to me was something like, uh, if you'll sign on for, uh, uh, for 10 more years, there's this officer program that's, uh, that's in place now. But it was something, the way I understood it, uh, was that uh, it was like a 10-year enlistment. You sign up for this, this program, and, and possibly uh, you can get, uh, come out of it with an 05 uh, at the end of, by the end of that 10 years. And uh, the sales pitch was, well, you know, look at what you'd be earning 10 years from now compared to what you're doing now. And, um, I had, fortunately, I had some good counsel uh, at the university and they said, well, that, uh, that would be peanuts with, compared to what you might earn um, if, if that's the only uh, consideration. Now, in 68, Vietnam's obviously going on. Yeah. Your, your involvement at all? Uh, I mean, my, you never went over there. Uh, not just TDY, uh, but not TDY. Uh, temporary, temporary duty, okay. like going over for, I went over for, uh, uh, for uh, well, a well classified uh, thing for mm -hmm. uh, just for a month, uh, less than thirty days. But uh, uh, and, and in fact, I did uh, I did uh, sign up uh, to go there to put in a tour, and uh, I, there was no opening for my my career field mm -hmm. uh, at that time. And I wasn't serious enough. I wasn't worried about it enough to, you know, to really pursue it. Yeah. Plus, the war really heated up in '68 when you were yeah. really getting out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, kind of tie together the whole Tuskegee Airmen, um, as as it affected you, and if you could explain the relationship um, that you had with it and the benefits and a little bit about the organization, or the I guess the. I'm glad uh, to have that opportunity uh, to share some of that. Uh, my experience with the, um, the organizations uh, that were eventually known, uh, became known as the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, had, uh, that experience was pretty profound, the impact on, on me. Uh, when I first uh, joined the 332nd and the 477 Composite Group, uh, at Lockbourne uh, in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I was uh, just briefly removed from, uh, from a whole different perspective and a direction that my life was taking. Um, I think that uh, my experience at that installation was probably the most profound uh, in, in my life because it has influenced uh, um, the direction that I've taken since that time. Um, and uh, uh, to share a little bit of the background on that organization, it's important to know where they came from, uh, to know where I come from with that. Uh, at that time, um, I, I quickly learned that this was a unique organization. It was the only 
uh, black organization uh, in all of the military services at that time uh, that were engaged in actual uh, military uh, uh, aviation, uh, flying airplanes, uh, uh, and everything that goes with that, the entire operation, the entire support functions, ground support, uh, uh, operations support, uh, everything, it was like a black city. Uh, it had all of its own resources and all of its own uh, uh, specialists you know, who performed all of their activities. Uh, it was, uh, in my brief experience in the military at that time, that was the organization that had all black officers. Uh, we didn't have a single white officer uh, on that installation. I think with perhaps the, uh, there were, was an occasional uh, TDY person there, but not, not assigned. Um, what some of those guys went through, uh, they shared with me, uh, but in a very positive way. Uh, they, uh, the experiences that, that they had, the frustrations that they had, uh, being uh, trained uh, uh, to maintain the airplanes uh, and then uh, and then to fly them and then the other uh, for the fighter pilots that was the, the first group that's, that began uh, the uh, Tuskegee Airmen started off as a, as one uh, um, as one squadron the 99th pursuit squadron which later on became a, a fighter squadron uh, it was the first uh, uh, black organization, flying organization, to go overseas. That was a real, they faced real challenges uh, just accomplishing that. This was an organization that wanted to get into the fight. Uh, they were skilled, qualified, they had met uh, all of the, uh, all of the, the demands and requirements uh, uh, to be engaged in, in, uh, in, in combat and they wanted to go in, in, uh, and contribute their performance to that. Uh, it started off, I think, there were, there were five graduates uh, uh, on, in the first class. And uh, uh, there was headed at that time by uh, Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., the captain, West Point uh, graduate. Guy who spent four years at West Point, his complete uh, tour there, uh, receiving the, the silent treatment without uh, anyone speaking to him outside of uh, official duties. Uh, a guy who had to go and ask permission as a cadet uh, if he could uh, have a meal at the table uh, of other, other cadets and, and would have to get permission to sit down. And, uh, and often, uh, as I understand the story, was not given permission until the meal was over and then it was back into the, the drill and, uh, and so on. So some of the, the kind of harassment and you know, the kind of uh, ugly, unnecessary uh, experiences that, that this guy had there uh, was the kind that created the kind of discipline in him that as he became uh, the first commander of this all-black squadron uh, as a captain, and uh, eventually uh, uh, his promotions came uh, quite rapidly uh, to catch up with his classmates uh, from West Point. He graduated uh, uh, in the top numbers in, uh, in, uh, at, at West Point in his class, despite uh, all of the uh, difficulties that he had. Was he the first black soldier at West Point? No, no, uh, he, was not, he was not the first. Uh, there were, um, I, I, don't, I can't give you the names uh, right okay. off now, but there were, there were several. Okay. Um, uh, his father uh, was the first black uh, general uh, in the army, and, uh, uh, but that did not ease his, his mm -hmm. path at all uh, at the academy. Uh, anyway, when he came out of that, uh, the kind of uh, discipline that, that he had to develop the kind of self-discipline that he had uh, to, to move through that experience uh, made him the kind of commanding officer uh, um, to take over this first black flying organization uh, to get his training along with, uh, with four other guys who graduated from that. Um, I think there were more than that, but I don't, I don't have the numbers at my fingertips. So um, anyway, uh, 
going into, into taking this organization overseas into combat. And at first, the numbers of, of, uh, of cadets who washed out uh, at Tuskegee, where, uh, where this training was, uh, was established, uh, it was the only uh, training station uh, for uh, black pilots at that time. Uh, subsequently, uh, a few years later, uh, when we uh, were given the opportunity to fly bombers, B-25s, uh, we received training from um, several other different locations at that time, uh, different bases uh, where we went for uh, uh, navigation training, uh, uh, places for gunnery and, and uh, bombardiers and all the, the, the crew places, uh, the different kinds of armament uh, training that was required and we had people to do that as well. Um, Unfortunately, uh, what happened at, at, uh, at different times, we didn't have a home, uh, no home base. After returning from overseas, um, we had people who were signed at uh, Selfridge, Selfridge Field in Michigan. Uh, it was part of the organization. Uh, and, and the reason for, for these, these uh, different uh, locations, uh, we had, we had uh, Street personnel at Walterboro, South Carolina, Godman Field in Kentucky, Selfridge Field in Michigan, and I think there may have been, been a couple of others, until we all finally wound up with a base, a home base, uh, at Columbus, Ohio, which was Lockbourne. Okay. And that's when all the components from uh, different places were pulled together. Um, um, Freeman Field uh, in, in Indiana, there was a a very famous incident there where where the uh, the base commander uh, in order to prevent the blacks from using the officers club uh, designated all the black officers as trainees and then established uh, uh, the order that uh, trainees were not permitted to use the officers club. Uh, and that was a uh, like a uh, sort of a mutiny. What happened was 101 of these guys uh, decided that they would not uh, comply with that order. They went into the officers' club, and uh, and they were threatened that uh, with court martial if they did not uh, comply with that with that order. Uh, the last guy who was finally uh, exonerated from that uh, that and uh, at, at great personal sacrifice uh, to his career and, and both in and, and out of the out of the service. Uh, uh, received, uh, um, uh, I forget the word for it now, but um, President Clinton um, forgave his, uh, his, uh, his court-martial. So. so were the 101 actually court-martial? Not all of them. Um, they did select them. Yeah, but some, uh, some uh, as a result of that, though, uh, many of them uh, decided that, okay, I will not remain uh, in the service mm -hmm. uh, because this is on, uh, already on my record. Uh, I'm not going to go anywhere. Uh, every opportunity uh, that sure. would accrue will be put down by this uh, 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 court-martial uh, thing that was considered to be uh, like, a, like a mutiny. Uh, we still have a, uh, at least one of those guys uh, right here in, in Atlanta, in, uh, in the Atlanta chapter. Um, but the, the kind of discipline that, that we had to, to develop and that in, in my relationship, uh, as I came along uh, and joined this organization, uh, at the time that I did, and with the, uh, the experience and everything that was going on uh, in their environment, in their lives uh, at that time, was a kind of a conditioning process. And uh, for those of us, uh, the black troops who were brought into that organization, we were just sort of sucked into it. And uh, fortunately for us, for the most part, uh, these guys were, uh, were smart enough and dedicated enough uh, so that they said, now uh, the training that they, they passed on to us is that you better not fail at anything. Uh, if you fail, we're going to take care of you, uh, and it's going to be worse than if you had <laughs> that. And uh, and I think we got the picture. Uh, but uh, it was that that kind of commitment, that kind of kind of uh, 
dedication and and sacrifice uh, that that uh, that gave us the strength, I think, to prepared us to go in and integrate this uh, this Air Force, this Army Air Corps. Uh, uh, the the kind of racism that uh, that that I personally encountered, and I know that other people encountered uh, uh, the same way, uh, was. Uh, mostly kind of humiliating experiences for the most part at, at being uh, abused uh, uh, mostly uh, well all entirely verbally of course uh, uh, in fact there was some uh, some stereotype stuff about uh, black guys being like Joe Lewis uh, who, who was in fact uh, a role model in, in many ways because he was a champion and uh, we had him to sort of respect and that kind of thing to look up to. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I think we had a reputation of uh, every black guy is, is, a, is a, a, a prize fighter and, and uh, uh, you don't want to engage them in, in physical combat, but you, you screw them every other way that you can. Uh, and there are thousands of ways to, uh, to, to uh, express that, that kind of uh, uh, racism. Uh, most prominently, it had to do with uh, uh, promotions, and that, uh, where um, on, on any number of occasions I did, and I experienced it with other people, where we would actually train uh, some white troops to come in, and uh, in a very short time uh, they would replace us, uh, and with the promotions and all. So uh, that kind of humiliation, uh, and uh, not not only the humili humiliation of it. But the actual uh, loss of uh, loss of money, uh, which was um, important in trying to to maintain a family, and after being uh, um, involved as long as some of us were, you reach a point where um, you know you have to do that. You've got to finish off the job, and that that could be anywhere from wherever you make that decision, and depending upon what your circumstances were at that time anywhere from, say, 10 years to uh, between 10 and 20 years, and it, uh, that was a time that you had to uh, suck that stuff up. And that's a long time, and it, it creates a, um, uh, uh, some very, very powerful feelings, I think. Uh, that kind of deprivation and that kind of uh, vicious, ugly, uh, ugly stuff. So the Tuskegee Airmen organization really becomes your support group. We were our, our own support group, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, uh, as important as it was uh, to go out, to move out, and and, and turn the, the entire military around, uh, and that and that's happened to a very large extent right now. Uh, as important as that as that that was, uh, it was done at great sacrifice, at at great expense uh, to many uh, to many people. And I feel abused by that myself to a certain extent, but I think uh, uh, not enough to stop me from uh, from where I want to go. My, my direction has changed. Now, this organization, you are president of the Atlanta chapter, right? Mm -hmm. So this is an ongoing organization. Yeah, established in 1972 uh, in Detroit. Uh, some of the guys got together. Um, Coleman Young. Uh, uh, was one of our uh, pilots at that time, mm -hmm. uh, who got out of the service and um, uh, developed a political career. Uh, it was under uh, under his watch uh, as mayor at that time in Detroit, mm -hmm. uh, where the organization started. Uh, not that, that Coleman was a, the uh, the leader or the spark plug for it, but uh, there were many people who came together, and in fact. Uh, uh, as in, in the case, I think, with, with uh, a lot of military organizations, where there are friendships that go beyond uh, beyond the active duty uh, part, and uh, and together they make uh, uh, contributions to to their communities. Is it only veterans or active no. service belong? No, membership in in, in the Tuskegee Airmen uh, has always been open. Uh, uh, race. Uh, gender, uh, uh, it's open to anyone who uh, 
um, uh, agrees to work with, with the uh, directions and the goals and objectives of the organization, which is uh, to a large extent uh, to uh, help young people, um, especially minority kids, uh, get through some of the barriers and, and meet some of the challenges that, that they have to meet that, uh, that, that many of us have gone through uh, and, uh, and are no longer intimidated by them. So uh, there are active, mem active servicemen part of the organization? Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. So it's ongoing. Yeah. How many members are in Atlanta? Atlanta at the moment uh, has uh, about 50 members. Uh, which is uh, uh, a very low count uh, compared to other metropolitan areas of similar stature. Uh, we should probably have at least 200 members. Mm. Uh, that will be my primary responsibility. How long have you been president? Uh, three months. Oh, so it's recent. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to take you back a little bit. We're in going back to 1968 when you left the Army. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the, re the, the rest of this, okay. the sequence. Well, you, you probably recall in, in 1968 was, uh, uh, was uh, nearing the end of a, a very violent uh, mm -hmm. racial uh, uh, situation in, in the country. Uh, uh, at that particular time, uh, I was in graduate school and, and uh, I think I was doing a, a teaching. I was teaching some some classes while I worked on my, my doctorate. Um, this was in Maryland. No, this is in Syracuse. Oh, in Syracuse. Okay, yeah. sorry. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, on typically on on, on uh, I think most campuses in, in the country, particularly large, um, again predominantly white campuses. Uh, our, our numbers, um, I think uh, there were two other black guys in, uh, in my um, uh, graduate, graduate school at the Maxwell School at that time. And uh, um, I think we didn't face uh, kind of discrimination uh, stuff uh, after getting in and being accepted in that. Uh, we had the same challenges as anyone else. I think. Um, but what was going on on the campus at that time was there were there were uh, militant uh, undergraduate uh, students and uh, they were uh, agitating for their rights and, and positions and we had uh, to some extent an intransigent administration. Uh, we uh, did not have uh, I think the black black faculty uh, at that time were I could you know practically non-existent and uh, um, and trying to adjust in that situation uh, of, of kind of racial disparities and so on. Well, the, the city wasn't burning down uh, around us. Uh, it was very close to it. Uh, there were uh, riots with the police and so on. Uh, while I was uh, uh, attending uh, attending school before I got my uh, fellowship in it. I worked for the, uh, for the city, uh, uh, actually for the mayors and the uh, uh, Human Rights uh, Commission. And uh, so I was sort of exposed to, to, a, to a lot of that. In fact, my, uh, um, my uh, physical condition at that time, I think uh, I was going to school full time and I was working full time, and I was working with the, the police on one hand and the uh, <laughs> uh, uh, several other other organizations, and also trying to keep the community uh, focused instead of you know uh, the actual combat and burning the place down. So I did I didn't get a lot of sleep, and I didn't get a lot of uh, uh, taking care of myself. Uh, at that time. And as a result of that, uh, I wound up uh, having a heart attack. Mm, and and uh, this is, you were young at this point. Uh, I can say that now. I felt young. Uh, well, I feel now I was young, but at that time I didn't feel, uh, you were 40, I felt pretty old. You were 40. Yeah. Yeah, somewhere about that. Well, at 69, you would have been 40 years old. Yeah. That's right. Mm. 
Well, uh, in any case, uh, the good news is you survived. Yeah, I survived. Uh, unfortunately, I had uh, I didn't complete my dissertation, mm -hmm. uh, which was a real. Uh, it seems like uh, I've had two major blocks in in my life. Uh, I didn't get a commission. Uh, 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 from a service, and I didn't finish my, my doctoral. Those are my two uh, my two huge uh, disappointments in my in my career. But it's not over. I might, you know, That's you right. know, I might. Well, what did, what, okay, so you, you 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 convalesced. You got better. Then what yeah. did you do? Well, uh, then uh, I was offered uh, uh, another kind of a challenge uh, to work for the government again. And I, I took a job with the, as a training officer uh, with the Civil Service Commission. Uh, uh, after a, about a year uh, of teaching again, uh, it's just a, a kind of a normal uh, continuation of my uh, uh, management and leadership uh, studies that I, I taught. Now, where was this? Uh, this was in Syracuse. Oh, it started okay. off in Syracuse, okay. and then, uh, then it moved to New York. Uh, I, um, I uh, was offered an opportunity uh, to work uh, with the Carter administration on the Civil Service Reform Act, uh, a special task force again, uh, which I, I, I did in uh, 1967, no, 67, 77, uh, yeah, 77, yeah. Carter was uh, president from 76 to 80. Right, I, I give him. That's all right. Um, when I completed that, then I was given an assignment to uh, to teach at the Executive Seminar Center uh, at Kings Point uh, in New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did that for a while, and then I was recruited uh, by one of my students uh, to be the uh, director of training for uh, the Department of uh, Defense Logistics Command Agency. So I did that, and uh, I subsequently uh, had a friend who uh, was at uh, who, who did his uh, mid mid career training at Syracuse uh, as an 06 as a colonel. Uh, at that time, uh, he got his second star here at Fort McPherson, and I had been out of touch with him for uh, for a while. And anyway, I was offered a chance. Uh, uh, to come down and work with him uh, on a special um, um, kind of an efficiency review study that was going on uh, that turned into a, another major uh, major project de designing a new kind of uh, um, a military light infantry division uh, which was um, in fact it's it's been operational now and, and uh, in uh, not Vietnam, but um, Iraq. Iraq, yeah. Um, at at the time, it was designed to uh, to do um, uh, combat kinds of operations at, at Fort Drum and in uh, Alaska and, and other places. But the concept was uh, uh, the one that I that I worked on, and uh, that was with uh, Force Com, and. Uh, um, I, I had another offer from, from there after completing uh, that assignment, and I, I got some big awards and, and stuff for that. And uh, I was offered a chance to, um, to work with an organization that John Lewis uh, had, had established. And it was called, it wasn't, it wasn't a Peace Corps. It was, uh, Peace Corps was part of it at the, at the time he did it, but it was um, called Action. Was the name of the organization, and uh, he I wasn't said, in the government at this point. Uh, I mean, he wasn't. Was he a congressman? No. Uh, it was before. You know, I'm not sure what John was doing at that time. I think it was before. It was before he um, he went into con Congress. So, okay. uh, I think he was doing something else. In fact, uh, John was a, John had had been the first. Uh, Director, the national director for this agency. Okay. Uh, in any case, uh, I think it was in, in some political jeopardy uh, by the time I got there, and uh, uh, I think since since it's been 
uh, converted over to another uh, another kind of operation. But it had it was an all volunteer agency working with uh, young children and with seniors and communities and, uh, and so on. It was directing volunteers. And where was this? Southeast uh, Southeast region. The headquarters was here in Atlanta. Is, is that how you wound up coming to Atlanta? Uh, no, I came. I came to Atlanta uh, to work with uh, with Mike Brown uh, out of Forces Command. Okay. And then uh, uh, after completing that assignment, uh, Mike was shipped out to uh, to Germany again, and uh, I worked for the Chief of Staff for a while, and then he shipped out uh, to Europe, and then I decided, okay, there's nothing else for me to do here, so I took the other uh, the other assignment, and I retired from that. That's when I just decided I'd, I'd had enough. And you retired when? And, uh, whew, uh, 89 or 90 okay. or something. 14 years ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, that's about time. I know you have two children. Yeah. Their names are? Uh, Alicia and Portia. And they have children, uh, grandchildren. Uh, Alicia has, uh, has two, two boys, uh, Sam and Zach. Uh, who are uh, teenagers? Uh, Sam is 17 and a uh, uh, fairly brilliant kid, like his like his mom, but uh, but who decided that he's not interested in, in higher education, at least not at this time. Uh, his younger brother uh, Zach, uh, who was uh, very much like uh, Alicia's younger sister uh, Portia. Uh, who sort of decided that he does want an education and uh, he's preparing, uh, uh, his goal is Yale and uh, he's in his uh, sophomore, sophomore year in high school now. Uh, he's uh, an A student and uh, uh, an athlete and a scholar and, and so on. So do, they, do they all live in Atlanta? No, no, they live in uh, Brighton. Brighton? in uh, Massachusetts, right out of uh, Boston. Okay. okay. Um, Val, is there anything else you want to add? Well, I have a, a, a granddaughter who's four oh, years sorry. old, who's well. taken over the family. Uh, <laughs> this, this is uh, Portia's, Portia's daughter, uh, and they're in, uh, in Rochester, now back in New York. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Since, one, one last thing. Uh, Please. Uh, uh, since uh, since uh, I, was, I was divorced, and uh, married again, and I uh, have a wife here, uh, Victoria, uh, and uh, of, um, I'll say 12 years, and be on the safe side in case she's watching this. <laughs> okay, Val, it has been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mel. I've enjoyed it.